Hey, welcome back, everybody. <laughs> welcome back to the seventh lecture of Intelligent Systems 2020. Uh, and the last one on the topic of uh, classical knowledge bases and logical agents. Um, today, I want to first uh, introduce a second reasoning paradigm in which you can uh, implement uh, logical reasoning for inference. So yesterday we had looked at the uh, searching for models. Today we're going to look at rule manipulation. So that's part number one. Then um, the specific calculus that, that I will introduce is resolution calculus, is sort of the basic idea of the resolution calculus. Uh, then I want to spend some time on the final project because I, I get the feedback from several of you or also in the working groups that many of you are already thinking of, oh, wow, how, what can we do for the final research? And I'm going to briefly introduce uh, the main idea behind that. And then I want to spend the second half of the lecture, or at least the last uh, significant part of the lecture, on uh, ethical questions. Because this is usually something that we forget quite a lot as researchers uh, in a field of AI, um, and I want to spend a bit of time just making us aware of uh, what this means and the consequences of what we are doing, and also the responsibility that we have as AI researchers. So that's the plan for today. Um, remember yesterday I talked about um, Davis Putnam procedure, and Davis Putnam is just a uh, depth first search through all the possible assignments that you can give to variables in order to make a formula true. And what you basically do is that you look for models. And as soon as you find a model, so a, an assignment of uh, va values true or false to all the variables that make all the formulae true, then you found a model. That was the definition of a model. And um, if we're just doing satisfiability or unsatisfiability, finding one model is good enough for showing satisfiability, or having a complete procedure of searching through all the possible models, so the entire trees, um, gives us uh, unsatisfiability if we haven't found a model. Yeah. And then remember that um, if we wanted to show entailment, we had to add the negation of the thing that we want to show whether it was entailed or not. So it's a proof by uh, refutation. We add the negation of the assumption that we want to prove. And if we prove that the thing is unsatisfiable, we have proven entailment. Yeah? So this is uh, the example from the Wampus world, very simple example from yesterday. You have uh, some knowledge base, which is uh, one of the rules. Um, and one of the observations, uh, and you want to show that this is a safe state, so that they're in, 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 in the intended semantics, that would mean that there is no fit. And now the question is, how can we prove that? How can we prove that not P12 follows from the knowledge base, is entailed by the knowledge base? And uh, the procedure is really a cooking recipe. You transform your knowledge base into closed normal form. Uh, and then you add the negation of uh, the things you want to prove, bring that in closed normal form as well, and then you show unsatisfiability. Yeah, so here we're at the steps. So this is the transformation into closed normal form. This is in one of the slides yesterday, I believe. We did this transformation, so you have seen that. Um, we add this formula here and we add the negation of not P12 and get P12 itself. And then we apply Davis Putnam with some, uh, we don't even need a heuristics here because uh, we have two unit clauses. So we begin with one of the unit clauses, uh, say not B21, um, set it to false, of course, otherwise this one wouldn't be true. So the first step is not C11 is set to false. And then this uh, top one here doesn't change. 
this one changes uh, to become only not P1. So we have now not P12. Uh, okay, and this one becomes not P21. Now we have a uh, three more uh, three more unit clauses that we can apply the algorithm to, and uh, if we apply it to P12, then you see that there is contradiction here. So that means that the whole thing is unsatisfiable. There was a very simple proof, just applying unit clause uh, the unit rule on this formula. So that was now an attempt to find a model that would satisfy all those clauses here. And we've shown that there can't be such a model, so we know uh, the formula must be entailed. Yes? So I think the, the rule, and that was, might have not been very clear yesterday, so of course it only makes sense, and that was also what makes it efficient, if you have a unit clause that says, uh, uh, not P12, the only thing that makes sense is to assign the value false to it, like I did here, so they have, you have the unit clause, then in order to make this unit clause true, you have to assign the value not, not, uh, not true to the, the variable. No, for, I mean, this is a sort of part of the unit clause rule is that you assign the value that would make the unit clause true. And you don't have, even have to try the other one because you would automatically create a contradiction. That's what also makes it uh, efficient. And I didn't mention that, that clearly yesterday, so it's good that you asked it. Because if you have a unit clause, you don't have to try the other, so you don't have to do the backtracking. And I think in one of the examples yesterday, I, I showed the backtracking, but it always is trivial. It's always a trivial notion of backtracking because you will always have the contradiction itself with the unit clause itself. So it doesn't make sense. Yes? So Yes, so you're right. So we, we branch on uh, B11, and the clause on which we, we branch is uh, not B11. So I, I tried to write down two things in one graph, which didn't work. But you're absolutely right. We branch on B11 and assign the value one uh, false. Yeah? Okay, so that was the general idea of Debs Putnam. Try to find a model. And we use the depth first search for it, and we use some clever ordering of application of the rule, first by the unit clause rules and the, the pure rule, and then secondly, we uh, um, we have the heuristics on, on which variable do we start and which value do we assign it first. Yeah, so these were the first the things that helped us to in our search to find a model. Um, but there's a different way of doing things. And uh, the problem here is, in particular, if you go to more expressive languages, that you might have infinite, <coughs> infinitely many models. You might have models of infinite size. So uh, in this case, we have a finite models because we have a finite set of variables. But there are models which are, for example, graph structures, where you might have infinite models. And then searching for a, a model in a set, set of infinitely many infinite size model simply becomes impossible. It's, it's, it, 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 we can't, you can't do it. So we need other ways of deciding our languages and logics. Yeah? And one way of doing that is a more rule-based way. So let's go back to the same example. Uh, we have, uh, now these are the five clauses after calculating the clause normal form and adding the negated uh, assumption. Um, and now, basically, what we can do is, is remember one of the rules that you have seen in the course, and that is called modus ponens. And it's a very simple rule, namely, if you say, I have the formula alpha implies beta, yeah? And I know that alpha is true, then, of course, I can add beta. So this is one of the oldest and most trivial rules of, uh, or, or most well-studied and well-understood rules of uh, logic. It's called modus ponens. Okay. So in, in a way, this now is very similar to what we have here, our situation in the clause normal form. Because if you look at the clause number two, all it says is, for example, P12, 
implies B11. Yeah, that's clause number two. And clause number three, it's, it's not a clause now anymore. I, I sort of just let you see what it is. The, thir the third one uh, is, is logically equivalent to P21 uh, implies B11. Yeah? I, I guess that's clear. It's just the semantics of the disjunction. You used to, you, you write it the other way around, but uh, it, you rewrite it when you build the clause number form. You, you ex explicitly transform those formulae into this, and now I do it the other way around. But now see that here it says uh, P12 uh, is true. So that would be our alpha. So basically, knowing that P12 is true means that we can add B11 through our knowledge base. Yeah? That is just the application of modus ponens. And now that we have uh, B11, we can apply it to the first rule because that's also in clause number four. And uh, let me look for another one. Oh yeah, we have, uh, here we have the constraint that B11 has to be false. And here we have the constraint that B11 has to be true. So we have both B11 and not B11, and we can rewrite this into falsity. Yeah, so we've shown basically that we can rewrite the whole knowledge base into falsity. So which means basically we are unsatisfiable because we can never satisfy falsity. Yeah? Actually, the not B12 right of the building. That is the, uh, I would choose this one for the alpha. So we have this, this one yeah, is. Yeah, that's the negative, the negative thing from here. Yeah, right. So we do exactly the same. We start out with the negation of the, the implication, yeah. add it to the knowledge base, and then we show that it's. If you have this assumption, then you can derive falsity just by manipulating the symbols. So we're not, not looking for models anymore. We do symbol manipulation. Simple manipulation of the formula and adding what I just did was add new formula basically. And this was some kind of implicit calculation. Yeah, and I will show you some other of those rule manipulation calculi. Um, but the, the main idea is that you take some formula and you combine them, given some rules. So this is sort of called inferencing by rule manipulation, and you basically see very often that you have the kind of inference rules that define a logic or that define a calculus, which can use in order to prove or disprove satisfiability in this case. Um, so basically an inference rule is a set of premises uh, and a set of conclusions. And there are many, many different ways of writing this, so it's a bit confusing. I, I think in the slides themselves, I, I have two different types of writing down the inference rules, and this might even be the third one. So you very often see this is the one that I applied, so that's uh, modus ponens, uh, and I just have a, a, the different uh, implication symbol. And you just write the the uh, the premises, so the assumptions of your knowledge base. You write on the top, and then you have a line, and underneath is everything that you add. So it's just simply adding some new facts to your knowledge base. You can also write it like uh, uh, like this. So if I know A implies B, and I know A, then I can rewrite it into B. It's not a very clean way of writing it down, but there's very often these kind of things that you see those. Or you write it in actual language that you say, okay, A and B, and A, if I have both of them, then this rewrites into B. So I try to be a bit more clean and, and, and write it mostly down like this, so I can add new facts. But um, you, you will very often see in the, in the literature different kinds of writing this up. Yeah? <laughs> Well, let's say we basically learn to decompose 
all these kind of formulae into plus normal form? Yeah. Was that just to have an efficient algorithm and we're now back to the original form? Or it's a good question. We can. Uh, there, there are two ways of dealing with these rule-based uh, approaches. Um, the first is that you can use uh, the rewriting to, to prove entailment directly without doing the closed normal form and doing the uh, uh, this adding the negation by just saying I take the knowledge base and, and I manipulate my symbols as long as I have the formula itself in the knowledge base. So that's one valid way of doing reasoning. But the, the, the efficient one that I'm going to show you uses the same principle as Davis, Davis Putnam. So resolution, the resolution calculus also runs on um, a closed normal form, and it is a refutation proof by refutation. So you need to add, because the only thing it can do, show is unsatisfiability or satisfiability. Yeah? So the principles will come back, but you're right, there are more gen general in terms of the reasoning that you can apply on uh, on these formulae that we have now. So um, some, some known ones are the modus ponens that I was just talking about, which I used in order to show you that we could derive the falsity from the knowledge base. Another one is, uh, um, is one which, which seems somehow how straightforward, but basically uh, it's called the end elimination, and that is if you have a formula A and B or alpha and beta in your knowledge base, then you can just separate them and just add A, and you can add B. And the, the, the thing that happens here is that you have some string symbols in your, uh, in your uh, language in which you describe your objects, your object language, you have a symbol, and you now integrate this object meaning into your calculus. So suddenly I now have only this formula, so it now becomes a different uh, animal in the whole process of writing things. But we're not looking into these rewrite rules uh, in detail. I think in, um, if, you, if you open any classical uh, logic uh, textbook, you will see that a lot is of, of reasoning, automatic reasoning, is done by uh, these natural deduction rules in which you transform things. But I'm really looking at an, an AI algorithm here, which is very efficient and uh, does thing, things very generically. And that's what we're going to see in a minute. One more important thing is, though, that you can rewrite the logical equivalences that we have seen for uh, writing the closed normal form. We can rewrite all of those logic logical equivalences also into, into reasoning rules. So, for example, remember that we had the logical equivalence um, of uh, alpha being equivalent to beta, and we just rewrote it into alpha implies beta and beta implies alpha. Um, so, so this was the logical equivalence that you had in this list, basically. Uh, these are the rules that you use in order to rewrite a formula into closed normal form. But these are also generic rules, which just say that um, these two things are equivalent. And as they are equivalent, I can just add them to my knowledge base. And I think it was on this somewhere we have a... Oh, no, I, used the, I, I only used the, the, the modus ponens in order to show you that we had the falsity here. But I could also, if the, the formula had been a bit more complicated, I could first have rewritten all of that. Yeah? So as I said, uh, when, when you ask the question, there's one way of proving entailment that I'm not going to into detail here, and that is uh, just take your knowledge base and try to manipulate it into the formula, the, the implicant that you want to show. And, and that would be a, a bit this way, that you start out with your, uh, your knowledge base. This is, uh, this is everything we know about the, the five fields in the Wumpus world. Yes, sorry. So, rewriting the rules, is there any particular order? No. And that makes it so difficult. So, um, we gave you five of those rules or equivalents as rules in order to rewrite into closed number four. So, that's uh, deterministic. So, you start and you, uh, um, you end up. Uh, de definitely at closed normal form. But when you now want to, to do this uh, um, symbol manipulation from a knowledge base into a formula that you want to prove, this becomes a huge, huge, huge search problem. Because basically, which formula do you start with uh, and which of the rules do you apply to this? So if we go back to, to, to the next, uh, to the example that we had last week, uh, basically now we can, uh, uh, we have uh, 
the equivalence rule here, we have an equivalence rule here, and uh, you might have many more of those rules, and now the question becomes, which of the rules is the one that I should apply? And once you have the solution, this is easy, but if you really want to do that in, in practice, or if you want to implement this, you really have a problem. So that's, uh, here this is just uh, to show you that once you know how to do it, it's easy to do, as I said. So here we use uh, biconditional elimination. That was a rule that we had seen before. So if you have a, uh, an, an equivalence, you just replace it by the, the two implications, or you add the two implications. So this is the first one, and this is the second one. It's just the rule we had seen before, this one here. Then we can just uh, um, apply end elimination, as I just said. If you have a, a conjunction in your knowledge base, you can just add both conjuncts to your knowledge base. This is what we do here. So we add one conjunct here. Um, then we uh, rewrite this using a contraposition rule. So I go back here. This is contraposition. So if you have alpha implies beta, you can also write not, uh, not beta implies not alpha, so the order changes and they both become negated. You can check that all those things are equivalent, but you can also trust me, uh, and so on and so on and so on. And then you basically rewrite your formula into uh, this, is, this is applying modus ponens because we know V11, and then you can write it into this one, the Morgan's rule. You can apply... Um, um, yeah, so I, I, to be honest with you, I don't really know how to... Um, oh, no, 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 sorry, I, I know how to. Uh, because we started out with the, the knowledge here. We didn't have the negation of the... We, we didn't have the negation added. Uh, and basically what you prove here is that not P12. So this was the thing we wanted to prove. And by end elimination, it just follows and we can just add it to your knowledge base. So this is the example, as you said, we, we just uh, don't forget about closed normal form. We don't forget, we forget about proof by refutation. We just show that not P12 must be true. And it just follows by syntactic uh, um, manipulation of the formula. Yeah, you had a question? Um, no, you will be you will be given a, a cheat sheet in which you can. Uh, we will just put those. But then you should know them. So then I can expect you to know all of them. So then uh, they don't need to go to the cheat sheet. Okay, good. That's good to know. No, of course. I mean, I mean, who cares? So. We, we put them in the cheat sheet, and then uh, uh, um, I think the idea is that we'll have a Google Doc, and you just add things that you would like to have at the, uh, at the exam. Yeah, I would give it to you. Yeah? The answers, yes. If you can think of the answers before you get the questions, you can do that. Okay. Um, so basically, as I said now, all you have to do, and, and, and uh, this is in quotes, all you have to do is to find a proof. So that proof is the right order of application of the, all the rules that you have in order to produce the right uh, formula that you want to prove. And that is, of course, really, really difficult to show. What, one of the properties why this works is that in propositional logic, is that one of the properties is that if you apply one of those rules, the whole set is still uh, satisfiable. Um, so... Oh, if you increase the, the, uh, the, your knowledge base, the properties uh, only increase and you do not lose any truths, any true formula, which is the property of monotonicity. So you add things and your set becomes uh, still valid and better in that way. So you can just add to your knowledge base whatever you have derived without changing the meaning of the knowledge base. And that is what we may use here. So I just uh, produced new formula, and I knew that those formula, everything that I produce, is already in the knowledge base. So I basically shows that falsity is already in the knowledge base, and that the knowledge base is thus unsatisfiable. But the, um, uh, the one last thing about this is that uh, again we can think about uh, the direction in which we search. So forward search and backward search. So we can start with uh, all the formula we have and just run extensive, exhaustively all the rules that we have, 
and basically produce, produce all the knowledge about this knowledge base by producing all the implicitly modeled facts. So what I did here was uh, I started from the knowledge base, I just added things, yeah? And if you do that exhaustively, you just get more things that are already in the knowledge base, but now you get them explicitly. And that's called forward-driven uh, forward chaining. Um, the other idea is that you say, okay, now I, I, want, I know what I want to, to prove so falsity might not be a good one, but this uh, in the other example I had with the, I want to prove that there is no pit in one two, so not P one two is the, the goal. Then I could look at wh which rule would I have to apply in order to get not P one two. And that gives me another search direction. And if you, uh, if you work in, in online systems, for, for example, we have worked on reasoning over web data, where you often want to, uh, uh, to find, you have a query in your, in your web database and you want to find what the things are there that are um, entailed. And then you can start doing the goal, the, 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 the backward chaining, trying to find whether there is a good is a motivation that makes your fact that you're looking for true in the, in the knowledge that you have. But this is an online search, so you wait for this and that can take a long, long time. So basically all the systems that you see that use reasoning on the web uh, they do forward uh, forward chaining. So they, at, at loading time, when they take the data, index it, they also complete the reasoning. And for the AI students, this was, uh, some, or, and the information science students, this was what, what we used in knowledge and data, uh, that all the systems, the, the, the databases like uh, um, GraphDB, they do this calculation upfront by forward chaining, just applying all the rules that you have. Yeah. Okay. So this was a sort of more generic looking at rules uh, in general. So you just take equivalences in your logic and you apply it in order to do some rewriting. Um, but there's one specific application of this rule based approach that's very, very useful for richer languages in particular. So for propositional logic, I'm not sure. Uh, whether it is the right mechanism, because it's more um, it's more useful if you have uh, variables and if you have a, a richer language over which you can uh, do the reasoning. But the principles are very important to know and, and interesting to know, and that's why we present it here. And it's one of the rule-based uh, systems, but with one very sort of uh, astonishing feature, namely that it only uses one single rule. And that's this one, the last one. And if you look at it very carefully, you will see that this is very close to the modus ponens that I showed you before. So here what you're basically saying, we have two clauses. One is A or B. We have another clause which is not B or C. And all we do is adding A and C as in the clause, so A or C as a new clause. And the idea is that, uh, okay, this B implies that this must be a C, or it is an A. So if it is an A, um, sorry, if, it, if, if this one is a B, then it must be C, and if it's an A, it must be the A. So it's, it's, it's very clear that this is logically equivalent, this rewrite. But what is interesting is that it can be shown that this rule alone, only the last one, is sound and concrete, uh, sound and complete for reasoning and propositional logic, yeah? So this simplifies matter a lot because we don't need the long list of rules that we have to apply. And this is actually a rule that you have to learn by heart uh, because you want to apply it, but it's so simple um, that you will be able to uh, remember it. Um, the resolution rule itself is sound and complete um, for formulating clause number four. And it decides undecided, uh, unsatisfiability or satisfiability because we're in a finite space. So if you can't show unsatisfiability, we can also know that your knowledge base was satisfied. Yeah. So again, we need to, to apply the, the trick of uh, proof by refutation. And then this is the algorithm. Very simply, uh, you convert uh, your knowledge base into, and the negated uh, uh, premise, uh, no, uh, uh, conclusion, 
into plot normal form, and then you apply this one rule of of uh, uh, of reasoning uh, to this knowledge base, and you continue until you either can't apply a rule to produce something new, a new clause, or um, and that's that's uh, this rule. Sorry, here that there are not new clauses that can be added, and if that happens, you're satisfiable because you haven't found a contradiction, and that means that spectra is not entailed. And if you find a contradiction, like we did here, the falsity, if you can derive the falsity, then you can um, show that better is entailed. And in resolution, the falsity is called the empty clause because it basically, this boils down to, um, if we have a, um, if we have one clause B11 and one clause not B11, then if we apply the resolution rule to it, you can, you can think of sort of uh, that there is a or a false claim, because this is equivalent, of course. And then you get resolve this away, so you can just add falsity, and in resolution, this is the empty clause because it doesn't have any uh, uh, propositions that you can make true. So this is the algorithm for. Um, uh, 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 entailment uh, by resolution. It's exactly the same as I showed before. Now, nice pseudocode. And this is the rule that you have to memorize, the top one it is. If we have clauses of length two, and you have a literal that occurs once positive and once negative in the clause, then you just take all the remaining literals and put them in a disjunction and add them to your knowledge base. There is some of course, again, something that makes uh, this reasoning more efficient, and that is the same idea as we use in the experiment, looking at the unit clauses. And here again, if you have a unit clause, and this M is one of them occurring here, so you can just um, add the, uh, take out the clause, uh, sorry, the literal from this clause. Um, and then th this can be generalized to many uh, uh, contradict contradictory literals at the same time, but we don't care about it. So only, the only thing you need to remember is the first rule. Yeah? And that's the most simple one, and I'm sure you can remember it. So basically what you then do is that uh, there's a search process that starts. Remember our example here. Um, we want to show that not P12 uh, follows or is entailed. We added negated to the knowledge base. So this is the knowledge base. These are the clauses in the knowledge base. Uh, and then we have just to have to check all systematically all the possible combinations where there are contradictory literals in the clause set. So here we have, uh, let's try those two. On the left hand side, we have uh, not P21 here, and we have P21 here. So we can derive uh, B11 is this one. And then we have not B11 is this one, and we have the P12 from this. So basically, this is the resulting clause of applying the resolution rule on these two clauses. And we even have another one. So this one was on uh, P21 and not P21, resolving this one away, but we have another one. Uh, and that is the contradiction between B11 and not B11 on this clauses, and then we get the not P12 here. Uh, uh. This one is, I think, wrong, isn't it? Can, can anybody see it? So I don't think this is the correct uh, from these two. Um, okay, I'll, I'll have to check that. Um, the most important thing happens on the right hand side of this uh, search space. This is just to give you the impression that we have uh, uh, really to calculate all the, or we, we can calculate a whole, whole search uh, tree here. Um, and I will just show you how we, we find the contradiction on this side of the search, but there's a question. Uh, so I was thinking that here we do the B11 and the not B11. That's this one. And then we have the P21. 
oh, this is this coming from here, the P12 is coming from here, and the not P. Yeah, so it's, no, this is this is incorrect. Yeah, but this should, should be the correct. So I think here the, the letters are wrong. So that should be the not P to one from here. Yes, you. Yeah. This one. Yeah, so this one is then probably the one that should be here, and this one is the one that should be here. Anyway, so so uh, you, you get the principle. Let's go to the one where I know that it, it, it works and where uh, you can find the contradiction that you're looking for. And that is uh, on the right hand side, you have a uh, not P12 and B11, and you can uh, basically combine those two together. Uh, and you get not P12, and you have the clause P12 from the, the uh, negated assumption, and then you can combine those two, this one that you found plus the old one, and those build the contradiction that show you that the whole thing is unsatisfiable. And that's all we wanted to achieve. And this is a, another way of writing down this, um, this falsity in the literature. So it's either the empty clause like this, or it is the empty clause like this, and um, that shows you that your whole data, your, your whole knowledge base is unsatisfiable. Yeah, and that's what was what we wanted to achieve. That is our proof. So another way of, of, of sort of looking at those proofs is if you uh, um, if, if you really build a, a, a proper search tree in order to get down to your uh, um, to your uh, empty clause. Uh, and that is just adding the formula to leaves of your upside down tree. Um, but I, I mean, this is not, um, uh, it's just to give you an indication of how you can do some kind of uh, search in both directions. Here you do forward reasoning, so you take your, your queries and you go, uh, so your knowledge base, and you try to derive all the possible facts, for example, the contradiction, and here you, uh, um, you start more goal directed, yeah? So, let me just slide if you um, want to check whether um, that's P12 is until the knowledge base and uh, your result is unsatisfiable. Yeah. It could also mean that the knowledge base itself, even without taking into account P12, is unsatisfiable. So, you should check that first, right? Um, the knowledge base by itself is unsatisfiable. There is, in principle, no need for that because uh, um, the, these logics have the property that from falsity you can derive everything. So if the knowledge base is false, is, is inconsistent, then it is correct that the formula itself is entailed because everything is entailed from an inconsistent. So the, the, the formal notion still uh, holds, is, is, is still correct, that it, is, uh, uh, it, it follows logically. Uh, it doesn't make any sense because your assumptions are already wrong. So I agree that in a practice you should start testing whether your knowledge base is consistent or satisfiable. Uh, but for this uh, example, it doesn't make a difference. Okay, so um, you're going to practice uh, resolution in the uh, in the working group on, on Friday. Um, but, but remember, the principle is really really simple. Um, I have some kind of uh, trick when I write down those uh, uh, resolution cases uh, by just enumerating them all in a um, in a systematic way. So maybe uh, I just give you this, this trick for um, for Friday when you when you practice. Just write down all your clauses in your in in a, in a, in a enumerated way. Uh, yeah. So. So we, as we only need those three, I will only start, I only take those three. So we start with, uh, with three, which is uh, not P12 or P11, I think. Uh, four is then uh, not P11, and five is uh, P12. And then you, uh, we now start adding new uh, um, new clauses, and then I always write down where they come from, just to keep uh, for the book for the bookkeeping. So if I do uh, three plus four, then what I get is uh, B11 or B11. So I get P not P12, 
and then I do seven, apply um, it on five and six, and that gives me the empty plots, and then I'm done. Yeah. And if you if you if you do it in this way, that helps you to remember which one have I already done and which one do I still have to do, uh, and, and and that's easy to write down. Yeah. So that that helps me to keep somehow track of the of the things I have done. And of course, the the the, the goal is to Im implement this in an efficient way. But that would be a different course to really go into detail of how to do this in uh, practice. But that's an active research community. So in these different languages, in logics, uh, that's particular resolution for first order logic. How do you implement that in an efficient way? And it's very much, again, uh, heuristics driven search through all the possible combinations and uh, um, actions that you can take, namely which rule to apply on which variable and so forth. <coughs> And if you go to the uh, propositional literature, most people do research on Davis Putnam, how to do that efficiently. But here you've seen at least two different paradigms in which you can do automatic reasoning, basically in order to comput computationalize or to make logic uh, a computational thing, so that we can really now calculate with these explicitly modeled statements. Okay. And that is uh, basically time for me to wrap up the two first modules of the course. Um, so I've tried to uh, in introduce last week um, uh, state spaces as generic ways of representing real life problems for which we can then, from an AI perspective, give generic solutions, namely in those search spaces to find, to build search trees uh, and then apply efficient search algorithms in order to go from some state that you're in to a, a desired state um, as quickly as possible and to maybe the best one and so forth. We've seen that this is computationally very difficult because even for very simple examples, uh, we uh, the, the, the search space becomes huge. Uh, you might have uh, adversaries, you might have uh, imperfect information, all these kind of things we discussed in the first week um, uh, applied informed search where we have uh, human knowledge trying to integrate in, in some heuristic ways and um, even in, in games where we have an adversary, how to apply the same techniques. And then if we don't have uh, fully observable information, so if not all the data is given, it makes a lot of sense to, uh, to derive new facts via some human-like, I would call it, uh, uh, symbolic reasoning, knowledge representation. So this week we've looked into logical agents and how they, how you can represent AI problems in uh, logical ways. And then particularly from my also personal interest, how can we make this computationally interesting and working? And what are the algorithms that drive these logics so that you can apply them in practice? Um, so this is sort of uh, my area in which I do also research the knowledge representation side. Um, and now I will hand over the, uh, the what do you say, the, the key to Michael. He will give the lectures tomorrow and next week. Um, and they will be about uh, dealing with vagueness and uncertainty. So every statement we had so far, they were Boolean as it's called. So something was either true or it was false. And obviously in real life, that's not the case. So. Uh, a glass is how full or you know for a certain degree that a fact is true or not. So the notions of fuzziness and uh, uh, probabilities will come tomorrow and how to bring them in more complex systems. So if you if you have a, uh, several uh, uncertain factors, how do they uh, influence each other? That will be dealt with tomorrow. And then next week, of course, the hot topic in AI of machine learning. What are the what is machine learning in the first place? What are the basic principles and um, how do you evaluate it and so forth. And then on Friday, uh, Frank will take over again and uh, he's, uh, he will give a lecture on philosophy of mind. Uh, because of course the question of intelligence for machines also touches very closely on the question of intelligence in general. And how, do the human, how does the human brain work? What uh, makes us humans? And um, so I will later in this, in the second half of the lecture, I will go into the sort of the consequences and thinking about the, what is the difference between or what, what makes us humans and what also makes the ethical decisions then. Um, but the, the questions are maybe deeper even. So what does 
uh, AI also teaches about what we are as humans and who we are as humans. And from experience, this is always a fantastic lecture, so I really recommend you to come next Thursday. Uh, both those uh, lectures that are sort of uh, on the fringe of uh, uh, the, the technical, that are not technical, so the ethical one and the, the philosophy of mind will be relevant for the exam, so there will be a question about it. About the ethics is not that there is one stance which is right and wrong, of course, it's the quality of the argument and the fact that you understand the problems in the first place. Then there will be a, an exam on Monday, uh, it's two weeks, I think, from now, more or less. Uh, on Thursday, there's the final assignment. On Friday, you have to write peer reviews, and you have a question. Yes. <clears throat> are these slides of Michael and Frank also going to be on Canvas? They are going to be on Canvas, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They haven't published their draft yet, uh, but uh, they will come uh, shortly before the lectures. They will be available. And also, we try to make recordings, as I uh, said or promised some time ago, but uh, no guarantees given. So I think it's time for a break, um, and if you wouldn't mind, let's uh, have it a bit shorter because I need a bit more time. So if you could come back at half past, uh, that would be appreciated.